you guys uh do you guys remember that container that Sayla and I planted in the winter time in the greenhouse? Well, here it is, and today I need to kind of pinch it. So as you can see, some of these coleus are kind of growing a little bit taller and longer, and I want them to be more um, bushed out and shapely, kind of like a bush. And that way they won't just continue to create a long stalk, which once we get wind here and they're blowing in the wind, they could easily break. So what we're, what we're trying to do is save it from that breakage and create it to be more shapely. So I'm gonna share with you how I do that. This one here is about to flower, which you could just enjoy the flower and then pinch it if you want, but I'm not going to wait. I want it to start bushing out right now. So what I do is, if you see this growth right here, if you pinch that off, all of the growth along the stem starts bushing out. But I'm not just gonna take that little stem there. I'm actually shaping this container. So, from this angle you can see it better. It's kind of up a lot higher than everything else. I'm actually just gonna bring it down to here. Now you can see where I'm going to pinch it, right here. You can also use a scissors if you want, but there we go. Just took that off. That's where we removed it. And now if you see these growths here, these are fresh new growths, those will start growing up. And so will all of these growths along the stem. So I, I kind of took this one down a little bit further because it was up a lot higher because there's other varieties of coleus next to that. So to stay the same height, I'm only gonna take the small little center out of this coleus here. So that way it's, they're both kind of set at the same height and can start bushing out around the same size. See how much taller this one is? I'm gonna take it a little lower to here. It's that easy, you guys. I'm gonna turn it back. There we go. All right. So now I'm gonna go ahead and water this, and you can tell it's starting to get a little bit of a droopy leaf. And if you're still unsure if it's wet or dry, you can always check the soil. And the lighter in color it is, the more it means that it's dry. And it, even if you feel it to the touch, as you can see, there is no moisture in that soil so um, it really needs water so i always water underneath the foliage never on top in my containers because it kind of creates a separation um, and i like to keep it shaped really nice so i just stick it under there turn it on and i let it just go until i start seeing the water on the bottom and then i don't have to water my containers for a couple days they're nice and soaked all the way through. And then I will go ahead and fertilize every third time, but every third time I water right now. What averages being about every seven to 10 days. On my other containers that haven't been planted as long and haven't been growing as long, they don't dry out as fast because they don't have as much of an established root system. So. They get fertilized a lot less because they don't need to be watered as often. But I still fertilize every third to fourth time that I water. So these average about once every two to three weeks right now. But by the end of the season, it'll be about every one, one and a half weeks because they'll need water almost every day. The succulent birch log container is looking really nice and it's finally really starting to grow. So you know that all of those cuttings that we stuck in that soil are now rooting. So what I go ahead and do is every day, it just gets one little small pass over of water, which you can tell I already did, but I'm gonna just show you anyway. So we just go like this and that's plenty for the whole day. The soil in there is really shallow, so that's why it dries out so quickly. Otherwise, we wouldn't be watering it every day because succulents hold a lot of moisture in their leaves. So this is the succulent planter that we have to water every day. Um, it's the most we have to water a succulent container, and that's due to the fact that the soil is so shallow. 
You guys, I have yet to pot up this eucalyptus steel tower and I really need to. It looks like it's stressing out a little bit, but uh, I'm gonna definitely have to break that container to plant it up. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that real soon here, but it needs water every single day. Right now I'm just checking all the boxes for watering and as I water, I clean and pinch everything as I go. Right here is the trailing honey petunia. And what I like to do is go in right by the tip here and pinch off that tip as you see that's the plant growth and over here is a new bud you can go down and take it both off but lately I've been wanting to keep those buds a little more so I pinch actually right before that bud right there so we're just taking that top little growth off and it stops it from getting long and leggy and forces all of the growth on that vine to bush out and that's how you get a bushier petunia isn't that just gorgeous? So I want to show you something else as well. I'm starting to see the first sign of aphids. If you notice that white little dusting there and on the other flowers, that's the first sign of aphids. When you start seeing that, that is when you need to spray for aphids. We use the organic Monterey spray, but just know that you know, some on some plants, it can take some of the blossoms. Um, so if you want to try something else, that's fine. But our whole point is to try to keep the aphids down. You could also just throw some ladybugs on there. They're a big aphid eater. Um, if you can find some or order some, that's also a great solution. So the Monterey we're going to end up using later today. And we like to use it at the end of the day when the sun is just about setting because you don't want to spray it in the hot sun. It can, it can actually burn your plants. So the odd box of the group is this one here because I've had to water that maybe only twice so far this season. So it doesn't absorb much moisture, maybe because it has the secrecia in there and it likes a dryer, um, but yet it has the petunia in there. So I'm, I'm unsure what it is there, but for some reason it retains moisture a lot more than the others and it has drainage holes just as many as the others. So. Um, but it's kind of nice. There's a, that's uh, one less thing I got to water. As you can see, the banana tree has finally adjusted to its larger new home. At first it was really struggling. It had light green, yellow leaves, and then it also had spider mites, which we used the organic Monterey spray on. Um, and so now it all looks really good. It's a lot of new growths. The green color's back. Everything's filling in beautifully on the bottom of this container. So I'm very happy with how this turned out for the season. It feels so tropical over here with, with this banana tree. I'm loving it. Over here we have the peace lily behind the banana tree and it's not looking too great. I think that it's actually getting too much sun over here. So we are actually going to go ahead and move it to our back patio. As you can see, it's getting sunburnt on the leaves and the leaves are getting really light in color like that. Um, so once we move it, I think it'll, it'll perk right back. Here's one of our window boxes. And as you can tell, it's starting to get pretty dry. Some of the zinnias in back are starting to wilt pretty good there along with some of the potato vines and the flowering kale and this window box actually is a pretty cool story in the way that it came together in this box last year we self-seeded and planted these costa apricot snapdragons this year all of those that you see in here reseeded so we did not remove all of the soil in this container in this window box what we did was we just added soil where it needed it and we planted around the snapdragons so we just filled in with some different varieties 
We didn't have a lot of flowers left to make a combination, so I had to get kind of creative. So we added some Dreamland zinnias in back, some flowering kales, as you can see on the front, so over there and there. And then we added the flowering kales on the front there and here, and there and there. Um, we did the sweet potato vine in front here. This is the Margarita by Proven Winner. And um, with the Costa Apricot, uh, over here, we just have a trailing petunia, like a wave, and then some alteranthera, some sea geraniums popping up there and there. We added in some little verbena bonariensis that we self-seeded this season, um, and that's about it. Oh, and then we also tossed in just a couple of our own little um, snapdragons in there. So quite a few things in there, but um, it's turning out just gorgeous, and this was planted super late. So today is fertilizing day for this window box and we did about a tablespoon of the Bloom Booster Jacks in this size of a watering can and we're just going to go ahead and water it in there. I tried to stay underneath the foliage. Sometimes it's a little hard so I just kind of sneak that little water spout underneath the foliage to get the water in there. There we go. And I put about two of these in here. So one per half of the sides. All right, so now we're, uh, now we're moving on to the front window boxes. I always go through and uh, check for watering. I put my finger in there. I take a look at the soil. And they could go another day. And the next time they get watered, they're going to get fertilized. So we do the same thing with these on how we fertilize and water that we do with the one on the front that we just showed you. But look at how gorgeous it's getting. So there is one thing that I cut out of here. I cut out the Blue Victoria Salvia because it got so tall. I think it's from seed saving. I don't ever remember Blue Victoria getting that tall, but we seed saved our own seeds for this year. And they got taller than I ever remember, so I don't know if like the seed changed from saving it. Um, who knows? But either way, it didn't match with what was going on. So instead of tearing it out and hurting the roots around it, I went down to the bottom of that stem and we actually just snipped it out of there. And it actually made everything look more colorful as well because it was so tall and it had all this light green leaves and it was covering all of this beautiful color. So um, by removing that, it allowed everything else to kind of breathe and um, show off their beautiful colors. So I'm very happy with uh, pulling that out and making that decision. So it's not always easy making those decisions in the garden. One of my favorites in the window box this year is the bat face kufia. It just is so beautiful and striking even from a distance, but when you come up close, just look at that, it's just absolutely gorgeous. Someone just recently asked how we deadhead our cannas. So this right here is a dead canna flower. So just follow the stem. And as you can see, there's another bud with a lot of flowers coming. So all we do is go right to the end of that stem there and I cut it right here and then allow this one to bloom. Then once that bloom is done, then we follow the stalk all the way to the first leaf here and that's where we cut it because the canna multiplies. It's always getting new shoots and each new shoot will provide a stalk of flowers. So that's what's really cool about the canna. What's also really cool about the canna is at the end of the season, I dig them out and save so many canna bulbs and we enjoy them in the winter in the greenhouse I pot them up and then the remainders that we don't pot up I put into a dry paper bag and I store them in our basement where it's cool and dry and dark and we then go ahead and plant them in spring in the ground and they, and they pop up in a lot of different places. I'll show you. I know this doesn't look like much right now but right here and over here is our small little canna patch with bulbs that we saved from last season's cannas in the uh, in the window boxes.
today we are getting the pumpkin patch tilled so that way we can control the weeds in between I'm going into the science shed right now because I found something I have never seen anything so crazy huge like this ever in my entire life of being a little explorer this is crazy so I'm gonna take a look in our book here the kids are with Grandma Karen so they'll have to see this when they get home but look at how huge that is like look at my finger next to that see look how huge that is insane I feel like we always use this book <laughs> to identify like different little creatures we find. It's called a pinching beetle. It says that they are common at lights at night. So I'll have to look online. If it's called the pinching beetle, I wonder if it like pinches you or what? I don't know. This book is best just for identification and once we identify then we kind of just go ahead and Google everything. That is so creepy. Ah! It freaked me out when I saw him coming at me. Ah! I'm gonna give him a little air so he doesn't die. But I do want Lana and Sayla to uh, to see this big guy. I don't think they've ever seen one this big. I know I haven't, so this will be interesting for us all to kind of look up and learn about.